Amen. Tunakaribisha sana katika ibada yetu Jumapili ya leo na tuna furaha kuu ya kuwa unachukua muda wako kujiunga nasi kukubali neno la Mungu lizungumze na moyo wako na likutie nguvu na ni jambo njema sana. Asubuhi uh, ya leo tutaweza kuangalia katika Biblia yetu tutakuwa nasoma kutoka kwa Biblia ya Kiingereza kitabu cha Zaburi na Zaburi 13 na bila nasema ni Zaburi ya Daudi inasema How long O oh Lord will you forget me forever How long will you hide your face from me How long shall I take counsel in my soul having sorrow in my heart daily How long will my enemy be exalted over me Consider and hear me O oh Lord my God enlighten my eyes lest I sleep the sleep of death lest my enemy say I have prevailed against him let those who trouble me rejoice when I am moved lest those who trouble me rejoice when I am moved but I have trusted in your mercy my heart shall rejoice in your salvation I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me na katika zaburi hii tunaona Daudi akianza mistari ya kwanza ya minne na ana onesha ile hali ambayo moyo wake ulikuwa umekosa amani sawia tuna sisi wakati kama huu tunaweza tukasema pia mioyo yetu haina amani kwa njia moja ama ingine kila siku mambo yanabadilika mambo yanazidi kuwa si vile tunatarajia lakini kwa mstari wa tano na wa sita Daudi pia anatukumbusha jambo njema sana ya kuwa sisi wote ambao tume yakabidhi maisha yetu kwa Kikristo tunatumaini ambayo si kama ya kawaida kwa hivyo ni ombi langu ya kuwa mchana wa leo utakubali neno la Mungu li kuguze mahali na likukumbusha ya kuwa amekuahidi ufalme ambao ni ufalme mwema na hiyo ndio tumaini yetu mambo yanaweza kuwa magumu mambo yanaweza kuwa yanaonekana uh, hayaendi vile tugetarajia lakini Mungu ni mwaminifu na wimbo wetu wa kwanza blessed assurance pia unatukumbusha kweli huo ya kuwa Jesus is mine Yesu amekuokoa amekuahidi ufalme mwema amekukomboa amekupa furaha amekupa amani amen blessed assurance Blessed assurance Jesus is mine Oh what a foretaste of glory divine Heir of salvation patches of God Born of his spirit washed in his This is my story This is my song Praising my savior all that day long This is my story This is my song Praising my savior all that day long Abba
perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture now passed on my side, angels descending, bring from above, echoes of mercy, whispers of Submission, all is at rest. I, in my Savior, am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above, filled with His goodness, lost in His love. This is my story. yetu ambao tume mpa maisha yetu wakati wako ninamjua aliye mwamba aliye niokoa ni bwana yesu ninamjua aliye mwamba Ni Bwana Yesu ninamjua ninamjua aliyemwamba aliyeniokoa ni Bwana Yesu ninamjua ninamjua aliyemwamba aliyemwamba aliyeniokoa ni Bwana Yesu nina furaha nina amani aliyeniokoa ni Bwana Yesu amenikomboa ameniweka huru aliyeniokoa ni Bwana Yesu ninamjua ninamjua aliyemwamba aliyemwamba aliyeniokoa Ali e Mwamba, Ali e Ni 
tupitapo katika mabonde tupitapo katika hali zote kwa pamoja nasi na hata tuwacha bwana ni chungaji wangu sitapu za kwenye majani mabichi uniongoza kwa maji matuli uisha nafsi yangu uniongoza kwa njia za Tapo bonde ni mama uti sita ogopa ye yunami imba akika akika we mana zofa dili sita ni kuata. Fanan 
你需，他发难你需，那基督肯定。Fanya mambo ambayo manadamu awezi kufanya unatoa faraja ambayo manadamu awezi kutoa mananishwi fanya nishwi na kitu kingine. Amen. Amen. Baba tunasemani asante kwa faraja ambayo unatoa faraja ambayo haifananishwi faraja ambayo mwanadamu haezi kufariji mioyo yetu asubuhi ya leo na kushukuru mambo yanaweza kuwa yanaonekana yako sawa kwa ni mwema kwa ni mwaminifu au badiliki nilichosema nilichoahidi mtatimiza katika wakati wako naomba utupe moyo ya kukutazamia naomba roho wako mtakatifu watujaze afungue macho yetu tuone jinsi uonavyo Amani imani na upendo wako ujae ndani yetu ili katika yote tujue unafanya mambo ambayo mwanadamu haezi kufanya tumaini letu kimbilio letu msaada wetu ni wewe tu katika jina la Yesu Kristo tunaomba na hata kuamini amen. Amen. amen amen praise god church so today's reading comes from hebrews 13 1 6 i'm reading from new king james version and i'll read it out let let breath Brotherly love continue do not forget to entertain strangers for by so doing some have unwittingly entertained angels remember the prisoners as if 
chained with them, those who are mis mistreated, since you yourself are in the body also. Marriage is honorable among all, and the bed of undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he him, himself he say, has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Praise his word. Amen. So good morning, all of us. It's glad to be with you once again and happy to share this fellowship. And uh, these are really, really, really different times for our fellowship. Now is through the internet. Been glad to see most of you during the week physically. I've also been privileged to talk to some of you on phone, and that is good. And so today we want to talk about enjoying spiritual fellowship. Though our fellowship is much, much sweeter when we do it boldly, physically, as the Bible calls on us to not forsake the coming together of brethren. We do appreciate that times do change and have changed such that it is not very possible for us to meet boldly, physically, or as many would want to say, in person. But that we are able uh, to have fellowship one with another, maybe through phone, maybe through other means, but nevertheless, it is important that fellowship is continued. And from our uh, last week reading of uh, living a life of love, today we want to uh, switch gears and look a, li uh, a little bit at the moral issues, on the moral issues on what I've chosen to call enjoying spiritual fellowship. And we'll be looking at Hebrews 13, verses 1 through 6. Hebrews 13, verses 1 through 6. See what the Word of God has for us. Hebrews 13, 1 to 6, as it has been read for us. And we'll take it in three uh, portions one, uh, once again. And verses 1 to 3, we'll look at live a life of love, a life of love. And we'll see the, uh, the product that is of love lived out. Love lived out. There is a product or there is something that is produced. And then number two, verse four, we'll take it uh, by itself and we'll see that love produces honor or love begets honor. I would rather use that word, beget. So love begets honor. And then verse 5 and 6, be content in love. How to be content even in love. And so the writer of the book of Hebrews is bringing the letter to a close. And in this last chapter, he would want to speak to us on um, a lot of e uh, topics but basically, verses 1 through 6, he talks to us of the product of moral living, a righteous living, or let's call it holy living, and that he sums up in love. And so let's go in and see what the Lord has for us. Evidently, during this time, when we are all kind of held prisoner, we might be prisoner physically, even in our houses, we're not used to being in our houses bodily uh, for so, such lengths 
of time as we are today. Or you may be a prisoner in some ways. Every day we have to uh, kind of hang on to the words of our ministers as they release the figures of the COVID, uh, 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 of those who have contracted uh, the disease. And the figures and the numbers always have a bearing on tomorrow. And so it's kind of a prison that we are in. We are not able to uh, actually plan well for tomorrow. For tomorrow, we will depend on the number of uh, infections, new infections. We don't know what the government will say, what measures they will bring in for tomorrow. And so we've been in that kind of a situation. And unfortunately to say, uh, some have reacted to that in different ways. Um, there are many, many who are reported to be abusing drugs right now. There is more domestic violence. There is all manner of things that are going on as people to re react to these unusual circumstances. Man naturally abhors some, the unknown. We don't like the unknown. We, uh, we do well in a field or in an atmosphere of knowns. But when there is an unknown component, like we don't know tomorrow. Last week, so many were prepared that uh, maybe the curfew would be lifted up, um, uh, restrictions would be eased a little bit, make life a little bit more bearable. But on the contrary, um, things were to continue and more tougher measures put in place because the numbers said a different story. Now we've watched that the numbers have been increasing, increasing. And there, so there is obviously um, um, a, a, a feeling of hopelessness that is going on. Now, the writer of the letter to the Hebrews was writing a letter to people living in such uncertain times as we are in. They were not very favorable times. They were not very comfortable times. And so what does he say? Beginning first one, let me read once again. Let's read once again. Pick up your Bible and let's read together first 13, uh, chapter 13, verse 1 through 6. Let brotherly love continue. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by so doing, some have unwittingly entertained ages. Remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated since you yourselves and in the body also. Marriage is honorable among all, and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For God himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can man do to me. Father, we thank you for your word. Pray that in this time and such moments as we are in, you would speak to one, you speak to us. Let your words bring comfort. Let your words shed light. And let your words be an encouragement to one that we may know you have said so we may also say. That we may know that you have said so we may also understand. That we may know that you have said so it shall be. And may it be peaceful, peace and love even to us. We praise you and we honor you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so indeed... As Christians, these uh, Hebrews or these people who were living at that time no doubt had been rejected by their friends. They had been rejected by their families. And they needed a kind of encouragement or boarding that uh, would keep them knowing that indeed it's not all lost. Some, and I've been, uh, yesterday I spoke to a lady, a uh, quite young mother, uh, whose children had traveled up country uh, in March, just before the lockdown, 
And uh, so for two months now, she hasn't seen her children aged five and two years. So for her, it's quite um, a, distro, uh, a distro time. She can't uh, get into terms. And so yesterday she told me, oh, my children came back yesterday. They came from a country. And, uh, you know, rhetorically I asked because I knew the answer. How did you manage to get over the load blocks? And of course she chuckled. See, this is one person who is forced by circumstances because of the love and affection that is of a mother desiring to see the children, what come may. And she did a Kenyan thing and uh, the children got back to Narob. Don't ask me how, I don't know. But I, I know you know, <laughs> anyway. So um, those, these are times that may push us to do something desperate, uh, push us to do something that we would not ordinarily do. But the lack of uh, that uh, physical, uh, physical uh, closeness with our loved ones has a bearing and, has, and bears some weight even on how we deal with beings. Now, getting back to uh, what we are saying, live a life of love. The apostle here now says, let brotherly love continue. And he talks about brotherly love. Now, this is what these people obviously needed. Brotherly love. What is this brotherly love? A love that is, by the way, this love uh, is uh, Philadelphia from the word philia, which means a love that binds together, that brings together. It's different from the love that is of God, the agape, that is the unconditional love. It's also different from the life, uh, the love that is between two lovers. But this is a brotherly love, the kind of love that causes one to care for another the love that uh, brings someone to feel, as he's going to say, as the prisoners, be as they are, feel as they would do, that we would uh, uh, be brought together in feelings and in the fellowship of feelings. There is a fellowship that happens maybe Sunday mornings when we gather, there is that fellowship of talking one with another and join one's other company. But it's also, there is also another fellowship, a fellowship of feelings. When we feel, we care. That kind of fellowship is what he's calling us to, the brotherly love. And this spiritual fellowship is based on that Philadelphia or that love that is of a brotherly love. Paul, writing to the church in Rome, wrote in Romans 12 and verse 10, he says, be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love in honor giving pre uh, preference to one another. And so in brotherly love, what he would be telling uh, the people of uh, the church in Rome is that let there be humility even in love, no pride, no exalting oneself, even in our love. Pride does not exalt itself, he would say to the Corinthian church in chapter 13. But to the Romans, he said, let uh, uh, be kindly affectionate. And so this is the brotherly love needs to be a love that shows is a fellowship of feelings, as we are saying. The humility in love, no pride. And it is the love of deep friendship and partnership. And there should always be plenty of this kind of love among us and among Christians. So he says, let it continue. He says, let brotherly love continue. It's not a one-time thing, but it's a continuous thing that we are to cultivate a brotherly love. And so writing to the church, having this in mind, Paul also writes to the church in Thessalonica and in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 9 and 10, he says, 
But concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourself are taught by God to love one another. And indeed, you do so toward all the brethren who are in all Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more. And so he's talking about that continuity. He says, increase more and more. But he says something that is interesting to the church in the Salonica. He says, this, you have no need that we teach you more for you. Yourselves have learned that from God. You've received the love of, uh, from God. Continuing on what we were saying last week, that love is of God and God is love. And so when we have God in us, we have his love in us. But here he continues to say, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. And so there is the challenge to you and to me. And during this time, are we able to say that I have learned love from, G from God himself? I've learned how to love. I've learned how to care. I've learned to let my feelings, even on behalf of my brother and behalf of my sister, See, the more we live like God, the more we get closer to God, the more we will love one another. So he says this brotherly love to continue, also we need to get closer to the Lord ourselves. If a Christian really loves his brother, he will not sin against that brother. And so in the, uh, bringing it in a moral way, he says, let brotherly love continue Continue, and then he moves on first to he says, do not forget to entertain strangers. Because of this love that we have learned from God, then we will not see others as really strangers, but we will see them as creations of God, as people that have been purchased, redeemed by God himself. And so as we are, we will consider them also to be born again of God, brought, bought by the precious blood of Christ, and therefore, as we are, so also they are. And we may ask ourselves one question. How does God cause our love to increase more and more? As he said to the church in Thessalonica, um, that your love increase more and more. Indeed, Paul says, but we urge you, we urge you, we want you to increase more and more. And because I'm learning from God, I will have learned to love from God. If I were to increase more and more, it means I must also increase perpendicularly with my relationship to God. But also now he brings in another angle and he says, hey, remember the strangers. Remember the strangers. Why do I want to emphasize on that? Because we are in a situation, we are in a, in a climate, so to say, that says, you see strangers, you don't know whether they are the ones that carry the COVID-19, stay away from them. This, so this is going to be a difficult one. This is a difficult one, isn't it? We, you know, last week I watched a video that had gone viral over the internet and a lady, uh, an old grandma wanted to meet with her children, her grandchildren, and hug them. But uh, <laughs> because of the restrictions, there's no way she was going to come into the house of her daughter and grab the grandchildren and, and hug them and uh, sp spread love on them. And so what they did, uh, the lady ingeniously uh, made a, something there by, um, by the entrance, poly, made of polythene, where the grandma would come, put her hands through, and uh, hug the children. So they are not coming into bodily contact, but she's still hugging them, trying now to satisfy this, what we are calling the spiritual fellowship, okay? The fellowship of feelings. They are strong. They need an outlet, don't they? And some of us are in that prison because we're not able to give that love that is bothering us from the inside. You want to love on your uh, 
parents, <laughs> they may be aged. We've been told, hey, you are likely to give them uh, uh, the COVID-19 and they won't survive <laughs> because they're old. And so you create a, a something in between there to come and... Uh, so how does God cause our love to increase the more in situations like these ones? Well, God sometimes puts us in circumstances that force us to practice Christian love. What do I mean? Love or for us Christianity. See, Jesus said, by this you shall be known as my disciples if you love one another. Means that uh, love is more like the DNA or that which drives through our system, all right, that causes all other virtues of Christianity to be evident and to be seen. And sometimes um, those who do fitnesses, you can ask them, sometimes if your muscles aren't working right, then your circulation also will be heated or it's not very good. Your circulation is not very good. And so they will encourage you to do some exercises. And as you are doing your exercises, they tell us there is better circulation. The brain will think better. I do find that to be quite true. Sometimes when I'm walking, I think more clearly than when I'm just seated. So also, God may want our system to work. And our system works best when we are in challenging circumstances. When God brings about people around you who neither appreciate your love or who would just step on you and you are required to exercise that kind of love. And we're going to mention about, uh, something about it in just a few minutes and we, and we get to the marriage. But sometimes God will uh, cause us to be in those situations. The difficulties that we believers have with one another are opportunities for us to grow in our love. If we take our difficulties and our differences to be opportunities, then we will exercise that. We will grow more and more. But notice how Christians who have had the most problems with each other often end up loving one another deeply, much to the amazement of others, to the amazement of the logical world outside there. And when we crush, when we kind of uh, 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 scratch against one another, if we are true Christians, we end up growing deeper. Our friendship tends to grow deeper because that forces us to bring the fellowship of feelings that we did not have. Maybe we just knew each other um, on the surface as Christians. We enjoyed each other's fellowship. But now we came to really care for one another. When I realized, hey, what I did to you hurt you, and, those, and I began to own those feelings, and I began to do what we said last week, that love in its caring form causes me to come to you and want to restore you. And when I am desiring to restore you, then I also grow in my feelings towards you. And this is the fellowship of love that I'm talking about. When we are caring one for another, when we can feel what the other person is feeling, when we can own the same feelings. Now, there we are having now our um, feelings of love sharpened a little bit. He talks about now strangers, those people who are strangers. Now, who are these strangers? See, the point is that we do this for, we do not do this for other Christians, but we, um, our friends, but we do this for our Christian strangers, those who are Christian, but they are strangers to us. And in such times as we live in, forget those people and 
Africa, no, I've had the privilege of being up in a country, in a setting up country. Everybody knows the other person. They even know the great grand grandparents. And so there is a, a thorough knowledge of one uh, of each other there. And so uh, sometimes their relationships are much, much deeper than the relationships that we have here in the city. Here we just saw, know so and so is called John, that is Mary, or that is Baba so and so, that is Mama so and so. We don't even know their names. We don't even know what they do. And it's, it might be possible that even in a church, a particular local church, local congregation, one does not know what the other does. They don't even know where they work. They don't even know where they live. And yesterday I had one of our brothers who visited me here. And he told me, oh, you know, I don't know where, the, where anybody lives from the time that... Uh, uh, okay, this brother had lost his phone just before the, uh, we closed the services. And so he, wouldn't be, he wasn't able to get in touch with anyone. And incidentally, no one got in touch with him until they met with one of the sisters along the road and said, hey, you are there, hey, you're still there, hey, what is happening? Oh, by the way, if you go to the church, pastor is there, he's always there, you can find him. Oh, yeah, and so he came, and he was kind of saying, I've been lonely, I've been wondering where everybody else is. You know, I told him everybody else is at their home, and we need to uh, find a better connection one with another. How do we connect? Do you know where your neighbor stays? Do you know what they do? So how do you pray for your neighbor? How do you pray for your colleague here? If you don't know where they work. So many people have been laid off this, uh, this season. So many people have lost their jobs. So many people are going through situations. If you don't know what someone does, how do you even pray for them? So let's move on to a better fellowship than just that kind of uh, um, surface fellowship that people have, shaking hands after Sunday service and saying, hey, God bless you, have a wonderful time, and calling it a day and going home. This must be a lesson for us. The COVID lesson is that we need a deeper relationship one with another. But he says, hey, do not forget to entertain strangers for by day, uh, so doing, some have unwittingly entertained angels. Remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also, reminding them that uh, they could also find themselves in such a situation. So remember the prisoners as if chained with them. Now, here uh, prisoners probably has a reference to those imprisoned for the sake of the gospel. At that time, uh, there were many people in prison because of their involvement with the gospel. Today, uh, here in Kenya, praise the Lord, we do not have many or anybody in prison because of their beliefs. But are there certain prisons? Oh, yes, they are. Oh, yes, they are. Hmm. It can be that those Christians who are in prison for some reason, they are people who are taken to prison mistakenly, which may be they didn't do, but that's our system as it is, but they are in prison. There are others who were criminals as they went to prison, but they got born again there. Now they are Christians, but they are in prison. They're still Christians. We need to remember them. But on a lighter note, on a very light note, remember the prisoners presently like you and me, <laughs> those <laughs> that are restricted in their movement. You cannot leave your house. You cannot go where you pleased. Yeah? Right now, I would give quite a, a substantial amount of what I have, which is not much, 
to be able to cross the, <laughs> the barriers and go up country. I really miss to go up country. I really miss to go out of Nairobi. I really miss to be able to hold an open air and uh, proclaim the gospel to all. I really miss to come to church once again and see my brothers and my sisters and be able to fellowship together, be able to pray together once again, physically, in person, be able to talk about the pains, be able to celebrate the successes of one another. I really do miss that. And you know what? I can't be able to do that. I can't go out of Nairobi. I can't go out of my house at certain hours. And I cannot hold a meeting outside there. Nor can I be able to meet the wonderful brethren of Gethorai here at church. Why? Because I'm restricted. Now a prisoner is one who is restricted. If, not, if I'm not a prisoner, and if you're not a prisoner, then I don't know the meaning of a prison. A prisoner is one who cannot do what they want to do. That's exactly describing me. And so this... Uh, this uh, this verse would be talking to us at such a time like this. It talks about remembering the prisoners. How are you remembering one another? How are you remembering that brother who has lost his job and now is confined to his house? Mentally anguished, not knowing what to do, where to turn to. How do you relate with that other sister whose livelihood came from her being able to do some domestic course for those who were working. Now they are not working, so she isn't able to do those jobs that she would be doing and is confined to her house now with nothing to give to her children. And those prisons that we are facing even today, but the word of God says, Remember the prisoners as if chained with them. How will you respond to this? Absolutely, I will leave it to you. I will leave, I will leave that to you. But remember what he said in verse 1. Let brotherly love continue. This is one way of making the brotherly love continue how you continue, how you love on those ones. Let's move on to our second point in First 4. Uh, this is a huge one. I trust I'll be able to take just a few, few minutes on this. But it's a major one. It's a huge one. First 4, marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled. By the way, just that one he says, marriage is marriage. Marriage should be honorable. We shouldn't classify this kind of marriage and this kind of marriage. That this kind of, he says, marriage is honorable among all. Among all, he says. And it's an institution that needs to be honored. Now, having talked about that love, that brotherly love, that concern that we ought to have one for another, now he brings it even into the domestic scene. He says, hey, let the marriage, let marriage be honorable and the marriage bed pure, that there should be no impurity. And he says, hey, for adulterers and fornicators, God will judge. And so, by the way, there is no room in the Bible. The Bible doesn't give any room for adultery or fornication within Marriage, it is not there. You know, this is a wide one because there are people who will take the same Bible and argue about uh, uh, David, Solomon, Abraham, and the rest who had so many wives. And so we mando the definition of adultery within all of that. Uh, but that's just been led by selfishness. Because I'm selfish, and I think somehow I would benefit more with having an extra wife <laughs> other than just the other one, one. And so in my selfishness, I want to use even scripture to kind of justify my greed. It's just greed. 
And that's why we say, let love beget honor. Which honor? But the same selfishness, the same lust that would lead me to look at another woman rustily and desire to be with her. But I should also think about my wife, right? And in honor, consider my wife. Okay, how about if she also felt the same? And this is a question that men ought to ask themselves. And I'm not beating on anybody, on men or anybody. But we as men also need to ask ourselves, how about my wife? She felt like she needed another man. What would happen? And she says, okay, I'm bringing another man. We're going to share this house uh, with the two men here. Just think about it. You know, sometimes we mando <laughs> things just because we are selfish. We're not giving love an expression or a chance to express itself. If I love, I care. If I care, I honor, all right? If I love, I care. If I care, I will honor. And in my honoring, then I honor my marriage and say, all right, let it be pure. Now, what does Paul tell us in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and beginning first 4? He gives us some of the attributes of love, what love will do. And let me just uh, try to um, summarize that. See, if we take the concept of love in marriage and see where God desires us to be, we will see what extramarital affairs do to our relationship. And that the moment we allow another man or another woman, even into this uh, union, into this fellowship, someone will walk away. And that ma a person who walks away is called love. And when love walks away, then we are left with two individuals who will try to reason out together. And two individuals trying to reason out together have no chance, even in this world. Man, woman, you have a duty to safeguard that thing called love in your relationship, that it doesn't go away. Now, what does it look like, uh, that love, even in marriage? See, extramarital affairs are usually an expression of betrayal, an expression of unsatisfied and unsettled issues among the partners. There is no satisfaction and some issues that have not been settled on. And that's why it's so important that before people begin to live together, before people are married, that they would attend or go through some premarital counseling and hopefully the counselor will be able to take these people, offer their past guilt and past experiences, especially on matter sex. People ought to be able to wash away and kick away those things that are of the past, but they are able to now enter into this relationship pure or clean, if not pure, clean, having dealt with the guilt, having dealt with the deeds that were of yesterday. People simply are not content, and the lack of contentment is the one that breeds dishonor. Now, if a man would simply be satisfied and allow himself to, as Paul puts it in 1 Corinthians 13, suffer long, allow himself to not envy, allow himself to not seek his own, but consider himself a fulfillment for his partner. If both partners would consider themselves as fulfilling each other, then that selfishness would go away. And I believe such a man would then rejoice in his marriage and endure all things as the Bible puts it. That is the working of real love. So easy to be caught up in this. But again, let me just read first for once more 
and we move on. He says, marriage is honorable among all. It's honorable. It's sweet. It's best. If lived according, according to God's standard. And the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. Now the key word for me there is undefiled. And so how is the bed undefiled? Do not defile that marriage bed. Now let's move on to our last point and see that we need to be content in love. Verse 5 and 6, let your conduct be without covetousness. Mm. Be content with such things as you have. See, don't be covetous, but be content with such things as you have. You may be asking, what do I have now? I've lost my job. My business is folding. It's not doing well. And COVID has taken over. <laughs> There's, what do I have? That which you have is what you need to be content with. First of all, what do we have? We have the word of God that never changes. The word of God that is always sure. The word of God that settles every kind of heart, every kind of situation. Yet I know people are hurting. Our hearts are hurting. Uh, we are hurting even psychologically. But God says, such as you have, be content with. Now, covetousness is the opposite of contentment. Often, covetousness and greed. Covetousness and greed are excused here in Kenya so very much. You know, greed, covetousness should be, I, I think they are basically the only qualifications for leadership in Kenya. So you are greedy enough <laughs> and we, we call you, wow, that's a man. <laughs> you can go ahead. Because of his greed, because of his covetousness. Uh, no apologies, by the way, over that, because that describes who we are and what we have allowed to be. And so, because we have allowed that on the national scene, it has come even to penetrate and seep even into the church and the life of Christians. And we bring the same greed even into the church. We come with the same covetousness even into church. We covet in an ungodly manner. We um, are greedy in an ungodly manner. And we call that abation. That's not abation. Because abation is controlled. Abation is what God would say to each man. He gives gifts according to the measure of grace that is in him. He doesn't give you that which you are not able to carry through. He doesn't give you a gift that without a work to do with your gift. But covetousness looks at what the other person is doing and desires to be that other person. Not to do what they are doing, but for the fame that they are saying. Paul says in Philippians chapter number 4, verse 11 to 13, not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. This is a wonderful man of God who has suffered so much, yet has seen so much. He is speaking from prison. We are in our prisons during this time. And you are asking, what do I have to be content with? And here is Paul. He's saying, hey, not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Contentment has much more to do with what you are on the inside. And that's why he began with love said, let brotherly love continue. Let us have those feelings one for another, the feelings of care, the feelings of love, and that protects us from even that covetousness 
that so easily comes and overtakes and becomes a part of our lives. And I don't know how God looks at us and sees us when we are not content, when we cannot believe his word, because I believe his word, and he's going to finish off with that one. He says, hey, God has said it. He'll never leave you, nor forsake you. If you can believe that, then you don't have to look at what I have and desire it or be greedy for what I have. But you'll be content knowing that the word of God is sure and the word of God is true. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. He does not change. And so even in my situation, he will not change. So contentment has much more to do with who we are, what we are on the inside. It has very little to do with what we have. So he says, he goes on to say, for he himself, for God himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, so God has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Because he has said that, we can boldly say. And I, I pray that if nothing else, that we may go home with this one, or we may be left with this one today, that God has said, so we may be able to boldly say. He has said, so that we can boldly say. God has said it. He hasn't said it, so that people can hear. He hasn't said it, so we can repeat it to others. He hasn't said it, so that we can only believe it, but he has said it so we can boldly say, because it is in the inside. It is internalized in us, and so we are able to say it and say it boldly. Some of the situations that we find ourselves in is because the enemy of our souls whispers to us that we could be doing better than we are doing. The enemy of our souls whispers to us that God has somehow left us. That God has somehow been so, so angry with us that he has despised us. That's the enemy of our souls whispering to us. And when he whispers, sometimes we can also agree with him like Men all through the ages have found themselves agreeing with the enemy when he is whispering at us. But today, the word of God says, hey, God has said. And what has he said? I will never leave you nor forsake you. We need to kind of bring ourselves to a point that we will hear those words as if God is speaking them to you and to me. I will never leave you I will never forsake you. God has said it. And then the Bible tells us the reason he has said it is so we can also boldly say, and boldly say what? The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. If he is there, I will not fear. Don't allow this fear to get into our system to the extent that we will no longer care for one another, to the extent that we no longer feel We need to know that there are people going to bed hungry. We need to realize that there are people who wake up not knowing what to give to their children. Mental anguish. And there are no jobs. Let brotherly love continue, the Bible says. Let brotherly love continue, and I would say, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. Real contentment comes only when we trust in God to meet our needs and to be our security. Trust God to meet our needs. Trust God to be 
our security. And it is amazing that we are often more likely to put security and find contentment in things far less reliable, far less secure than God himself. But he has said, so we may say. He has said so that when those whispers come to you, when you hear those whispers wanting you to doubt God's word, God's love, and God's promises, that you may be able to boldly say, Often we believe it in ourselves. And I, I believe there is a grace and victory that is bowed up in us being able to speak it out and speak our faith. And I believe even the Bible when it says so that we can boldly say, wants us to just say those things so that we are free from that temptation to just fall into fear, fall into doubt. Are you able to say it and declare it audibly? Say it. Say it to yourself. Say it to whoever. Let even the enemy hear. By the way, the enemy cannot be able to read your heart. Satan has no way of knowing what is in your heart unless you speak it. He has not that capacity. Satan has no way knowing what you believe until you tell it to him. And so we boldly confess and say what we believe of God. And so we can boldly say that God is my helper. If God is your helper, then you need to boldly audibly say it. Sometimes we say we pray and we pray in the spirit. And sometimes we confuse praying the spirit to being silently praying. They are two different things. Praying means that we talk to God. Can you audibly speak to it? Because you're also speaking to the enemy and you're causing his whispers to have no effect and no power and no authority even over your life. And so this is what I hope we'll be able to do. As we have talked about living life, uh, a life of love practically, expressing love practically, let us learn contentment of a covetousness. God bless you. God help you. May he hold your hand. And above all, I pray that we will all be able to hear audibly, hear God speaking to us personally, saying, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Maybe the best words that you can hear God speaking to you during this season, this season that there are temptations to feel left out by the world. No, they are just being caring. Caring to you, they don't want to bring the virus to you. Caring about themselves, they don't want to get it from you. And so we keep in that distance. They call it social distance. I like to call it personal distance, social has other connotations. So we keep distance from each other because we love and honor and care about one another. And may the enemy not uh, whisper anything to the contrary, that you begin now not loving and not caring about each other. May we defeat that by audibly saying, the Lord says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And therefore we can boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I shall not fear. Father, we thank you and we bless you. And once again, thank you for your word. Your word that is a light unto our paths. Words that are a lamp unto our feet. That we can be able to walk knowingly. That we can be able to walk in hope. Now, in this time, it's so easy to lose hope. No one is sure of what will be told today evening. No one is sure what measures will be brought in tomorrow. But one thing we can be sure of, you have said it. You never leave us nor forsake us. And therefore we can boldly say that you are our helper and we shall not fear. I pray the same to all that are listening, to all that are viewing, 
and to every saint of Calvary Chapel Gethurai. May that be our inheritance today, that surely the Lord is our helper, and we shall not fear. We bless you, and we honor you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Lord bless you, and have yourself a wonderful time. God bless you. Kila siku, kila saa, Siku, kila saa, kwa minifu, kwa kila siku, kila siku, kila saa, kwa minifu, kwa minifu, kwa kila siku, kila siku, kila saa. Yes, I mean.